three, two, and one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's events with, with 192 Books and Paula Cooper Gallery. I am Evan, the manager at 192 Books, and I am so thrilled to welcome everyone tonight to um, a celebration of the life and work of John Ashbery. Um, we are all huge fans of Ashbery at the store and, and, and love hearing his work uh, read aloud. So tonight we're in for a real treat, and <laughs> I don't even want to stay in the way of it too long. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jeffrey Leffendorf, who is the editor of the book, Something Close to Music, uh, late art writings, playlists, and poems by John Ashbery, out now from David's Orient Books. He is also the executive director of the Flowchart Foundation. So over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much, Evan. I think I'm on camera. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, I'm in Hudson, New York, where it is about uh, 11 million degrees. So I am literally deliriously happy to be here celebrating John Ashbery's birthday. He would have been 95 today. Happy birthday, John. Um, he, of course, passed five years ago. And uh, it's wonderful to be uh, celebrating him by reading from this new book, Something Close to Music, Late Art Writing, Poems, and Playlist by John Ashbury. And I just want to say a very little bit about it. And then we're going to hear from our cadre of uh, art writing and poet luminaries. And I can also say poet slash art writing luminaries, uh, one by one. And then we're going to hopefully have time for a chat at the end. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about this book, and I should say a word about the Flowchart Foundation. It's named, of course, after Ashbury's book, Flowchart. He named the organization, and we exist today uh, continuing to fulfill our mission of exploring the interrelationships of various art forms toward opening up new possibilities. I think Ashbury is the poet of possibility, and um, this book is really a, a book version of that mission. Uh, it might appear at first to be an anthology, of art writing with some poems thrown in and some playlists, but it really is focusing on the poetry. And for me, what makes it interesting is it really is a project in that it has um, playlists, music he was listening to around the time that he was writing these poems. And we'll hear more later, he always listened to music while writing. And also the art he was looking at and writing about. And it's how they reverberate and if I may mix you a met metaphor, uh, shine light on one another. Uh, that really is what the book is about. And I just wanna read two things from very early pieces that John wrote. Um, in a review of uh, Yves Tanguy, which he wrote in 74, we're gonna hear a much later piece also about Yves Tanguy later in this book. Um, he wrote, most artists would like to believe that their work renders criticism superfluous since criticism is included in the art of creation. And most of you probably know that Ashbery was notorious for refusing to discuss his poetics. You, you read the work and you loved it and you got figured out what you could. Um, but I also want to read another line. This is from a 1971 uh, review of Gertrude Stein. And it's really what, what launched this book in many ways. Poets, when they write about other artists, always tend to write about themselves. And so it's through so much of this art criticism, which is wonderful writing uh, unto itself. And also because it's later pieces that are so frequently, um, you know, he could choose to write them about dear, dear friends. And so you learn a lot about the circle of Ashbury, but I think a lot is revealed. Um, my experience in reading so many of these pieces is, is, is I think, wait, that's what you do. And so what he tends to focus on in an artist, visual artist work is frequently really his own poetics in a sense. So that's that's the secret key to the book. And um, before uh, moving on to uh, Monica Della Torre who wrote the really fabulous introduction, which we're gonna hear just a teeny bit of, and I will tell you that it's much more extensive and it goes into detail about pieces in the book and exactly how they relate and speak to one another. It's ekphrastic in the most generous definition of the word. Ekphrastic usually means you know, poetry that is about painting or that's in conversation with painting. And we're taking a plastic to mean art forms about one another or in conversation with one another. So that's really what this is. Um, I do wanna uh, thank uh, 192 Books and Paula Cooper Gallery and Paula Cooper for, for hosting this. And I also have to thank uh, Zorner Books, the, the team there was so fantastic. Um, those who have ever been involved in publishing a book know that it is a team effort. And they're a great team. So of course, I wanna thank Lucas Renner for going for this kind of nutty project. <laughs> and uh, in particular, Beth Gordon, the really fabulous series editor um, who 
played a large role in shaping this book. So special, special thanks to her and the whole team there. Um, Doro, Molly, Felice, Joey, I hope I'm getting everyone up. They're all fantastic. So thank you, Zwerner Books. Um, you should get them all, like I have, collect them all. <laughs> and of course, get your copy of Something Close to Music at 192 Books. And now without further ado, we're gonna hear um, some little bits and pieces throughout the book. And we're gonna start with Monica De La Toy. Take it away, Monica. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's so great to be here on Ashbury's birthday, which is always um, a very special, special time. I remember multiple programs in the last years um, in celebration of his legacy. And he feels very much alive. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Jeffrey, for inviting me to write the introduction. Um, I will read you, as Jeffrey said, um, just a little a bit of it. And uh, it's called Three Sisters. And basically I'm just going off of the trope of the sister arts, poetry and painting. Those are two, but there's actually more sisters and music of course, being one of them. So it's a little fable of sorts. Um, here we go. Picture the sister arts, poetry and painting in the oft told story about ekphrasis. As you most likely know, the story goes that the former was given to talking while the, later, while, while the latter was mute. They were in a close relationship that was sometimes symbiotic, sometimes adversarial, and all too often love-hate. In the beginning, poetry would tell stories that were epic, biblical, historic, while her sister would make stories materialize before an audience with an astonishing immediacy, presenting each and every one of their visualizable elements, even those that poetry deemed too trivial to relate, for to relate them all would take an inordinate amount of time. Although painting could transform words, even thousands of words, into pictures with borrowed content, she made no pictures of her own. She was no dummy, however, and eventually realized not only that she could paint whatever she wanted, but that she had been doing that all along when it came to representing what couldn't be put into words. The tables would turn now and again, and when poetry was tongue-tied, she would take inspiration from painting instead voicing the stories in her sister's works and sometimes even speaking as if from inside them, like a ventriloquist. When she did this, she was called ekphrastic, although in truth, she was always throwing her voice a bit, a bit surreptitiously. Poetry loved the sound of her own voice and was prone to droning on. Her friends recommended that if she wished to remain relevant in modern times, she stop wasting words and follow her sister's example by using only those that supported the display of images in the poem. She'd also have to minimize contact with her other sister, Music, with whom she'd once been close, for Music spoke in a language too vague or abstract to pin down and was a bad influence. Her friends would riff off Horace's dictum ut pictura poesis, as is painting, so was poetry. Words were too precious to waste. She ought to economize. Poetry tried to comply. But in due course, both she and painting began wondering why they had to keep minding what, each other, what the other one was doing. Why couldn't each just go about their business? It was time to set out on their own paths. That they did so and merrily did not mean that they would have to stop frequenting each other, even after art critics began courting painting rather aggressively, advocating for her independence from the other arts under the banner of medium specificity. Whenever the sister arts got chummy with each other again, their respective friends warned that their identities would get all tangled up, leading to the much dreaded confusion of the arts. But the sisters knew that family is family after all. Each member's identity resulting from the projections intrinsic to family dynamics. And deep inside, they relished their interdependence. Besides, they were feeling outshined by newcomers to the arts and old prescri prescriptions were getting musty. The times had changed. Modernism was old hat. Poetry started wondering why she couldn't visit with her sister music more often. So passe were her old friends, they hadn't even noticed that music had changed quite a bit herself. Then I'm gonna skip to um, what you're actually going to read and encounter in this book. The writing you're about to read is one, at once exuberant, heartfelt and vivid, breezy yet thick with accumulated experience. 
Overall, Ashbury's art criticism rarely feels constrained by the standards expected of specialized critics and art historians. Poets and artists are the only authorities he quotes. Yet here, it feels even more freewheeling. The essays often read like palimpsests in which layers of reflections drawn from different time periods are overlaid on top of one another. They range from anecdotal vignettes to precise yet nonetheless eccentric observations, often personifying the art under discussion. From character studies of the artist to records of Ashbury's experience of experiencing both the artworks and the artists who made them. After all, he did claim that his poems sought to capture not experience, but the experience of experience, clearly a gregarian one, a gregarious one at that. Read this book as an object lesson, not so much on how to write poems and essays about art, but on how to write through and out of art. Read it as a discontinuous record of Ashbury's loves, of the intensity of his fellow feeling towards the artist and his milieu, and his genuine amazement at the art being made by them. And read it too as a side entrance into Ashbury's poetics and as a record of the ecstatic entwinement of art, poetry, and music in his mind. For once, the writing Ashbury produced while listening to music, deliriously ranging from Christian Wolff's works to John Cage's indeterminacy to Brian Eno's soothing ambient music to Conlon and Caro's zany player piano compositions, appears side by side to the delight of the three sisters. You can feel them throughout the collection, horsing around, aping one another and egging one another on. So I will read you a poem. The first poem that appears in the collection is called Vetiver. And it accompanies uh, an autobiographical short little piece that was actually published in 19, um, what is it? Is it 1998? Uh, by Jack Tilton Gallery. It was an autobiographical piece for an exhibition on art by, by writers and it included Burroughs and Cummings, Blake, Allen Ginsberg, Brian Geisen, et cetera. It's a great little piece because it tells a lot, it, it really talks about how um, he began his career as an artist first. So the piece is called Vetiver. Ages pass slowly like a load of hay, as the flowers resided their lines and pike stirred at the bottom of the pond. The pen was cool to the touch. The staircase swept upward through fragmented garlands, keeping the melancholy already distilled in letters of the alphabet. It would be time for winter now. It spun sugar palaces and also lines of care at the mouth, pink smudges on the forehead and cheeks, the color once known as ashes of roses. How many snakes and lizards shed their skins for time to be passing on like this, sinking deeper in the sand as it wound toward the conclusion? It had all been working so well and now, well, it just kind of came apart in the hand as a change is voiced, sharp as a fish hook in the throat and decorative tears flowed past us into a basin called infinity. There was no charge for anything. The gates had been left open intentionally. Don't follow, you can have whatever it is. And in some room, someone examines his youth, finds it dry and hollow, porous, porous to the touch. Oh, keep me with you unless the outdoors embraces both of us, unites us, unless the bird catchers put away their twigs, the fishermen haul in their cheek, their sleek empty nests, nets, and other become become part of the immense crowd around this bonfire, a situation that has come to mean us to us, and the crying in the leaves is saved, the last silver drops. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I, there we are. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read just a little bit. I, I want to read actually just the first sentence from that piece that Monica just referred to, which is the first piece in the book. It's not a piece of art criticism. It's an unusual autobiographical artist statement by, by Ashbury. I'm just going to read the first sentence. As a child, I always wanted to be an artist and drew constantly, mostly figures of women. In 1936, when I was nine, 
life did it spread on the fantastic art Dada surrealism show at the Museum of Modern Art. And that made me want to be a surrealist. And I'm just gonna read um, one poem and you'll hear the connection right away. Life as a book that has been put down. We have erased each letter and the statement still remains vaguely like an inscription over the door of a bank with hard to figure out Roman numerals that say perhaps too much in their way. Weren't we being surrealists? And why did strangers at the bar analyze your hair and fingernails as though the body wouldn't seek and find that most comfortable position and your head, that strange thing, become more problematic each time the door was shut? We have talked to each other, taken each thing only just so far, but in the right order. So it is music or something close to music telling from afar. We have only some knowledge and more than that required ambition to shape it into a fruit made of cloud that will protect us until it goes away. But the juice thereof is bitter. We have not such in our gardens and you should go up into knowledge with this careless sarcasm and be told there for once, it is not here. Only the smoke stays and silence and old age that we have come to construe as a landscape somehow and the peace that breaks all records and singing in the land, delight that will be and does not know us. And now Lucy Ives. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, I'm gonna read first a piece from 1989 on Yves Tanguy. How surreal is surrealist painting? The question has been argued at least since 1925, when Pierre Navi wrote in the review, La Révolution Surrealiste, everyone knows now that there is no surrealist painting. Neither pencil marks recording chance gestures, nor images representing dream figures, nor imaginary fantasies can be so qualified. He went on to clarify this point somewhat. How is it that what we call literature is nurtured almost exclusively by love and that words turn love so easily to account while the plastic arts are cut off from it or that we only glimpse it there, veiled and ambiguous? There is really no literary equivalent of the nude. Perhaps even literature had to cheat a little in order to be able to call itself surrealist. Automatic writing was the ideal and it was occasionally practiced by Breton and others during the early days of the movement, but the results are usually so unsatisfactory as literature that something obviously had to be done. Even the writing labeled automatic has obviously been shaped and smoothed after the fact of its execution, while the finest poetry of Breton, Elouard, and Aragon shares the ideals of order and clarity that have characterized French literature since Racine and Boyou. Only the subject matter is different. How much more diff difficult then for a painter to transcribe the spontaneous madness of the surrealist vision with the laborious means at his disposal. Thus, from the beginning, most surrealist painters settled for illustrating Navi's images representing dream figures with techniques not very different from those of a Van Eyck or a Vermeer. Not until the later works of Jackson Pollock and action painting would the act of painting itself become surrealist. And by that time, painting was abstract, having abandoned dream figures. Although the surrealist painters sometimes use random procedures such as Ernst's frottage, Masson's sand painting, and Wolfgang Pollen's fumage, in which smoke from a lit candle held close to the canvas was used to suggest forms, the results have the finished look of these artists traditionally made pictures and those by Dali, Magritte and Delvaux. Hence a staleness or weariness in so much of this work. The energy of the image has been siphoned off in the task of representing it. One could argue that a handful of artists in their different ways successfully met the challenge of surrealism's call for the liberté totale Arp, despite his abstract language, Clay and DeShirico, although they remained on the fringes of the movement. Miro, whose customary badinage can seem alien to its spirit, and especially Tanguy. 
As his style evolved from its rather crude and naive beginnings in the 1920s through the amazing illusionism of his later years, it came to seem that a mechanism as skilled and impersonal as a camera lens, ideal for documenting the imaginary animal, vegetal, and mineral phenomena that inhabit his paintings. Beings of a type that never encountered, beings of a type never encountered before, yet palpably real, living if not breathing. Once articulated, his mature style changed very little. Instead, development takes the form of a steadily increasing tension. Forms can pullulate endlessly, amoeba-like in late paintings, such as the 1954 From Green to White, although they can just as easily turn monolithic as in My Life, Black and White, of a decade before. At most, there are shifts of perspective in some of the pictures of his last phase. One's viewpoint may be situated slightly below the activity on the canvas instead of above it. Objects can crowd the foreground instead of receding endlessly toward the horizon. Color takes on a greater feeling of saturation or sharpness. Tangi noted in the 1940s, here in the United States, the only change I can distinguish in my work is possibly in my palette. Perhaps it is due to the light. I also have a feeling of greater space here and more room, but that was why I came here. Although Dali and Magritte were equally skilled technicians and Dali perhaps even more so, what they chose to record was the real world seen through surrealism's distorting lens. The concrete abstractions that are constantly erupting on Tutangi's canvases are closer to the surrealist ideal of all that has ever been, that has never been, which alone interests us in Eluard's phrase. Paradoxically spontaneous, despite the hours of painstaking labor that went into their execution. Thus, at a time when people are no longer when people no longer have problems construing as art Navi's pencil marks recording chance gestures, when the results seem to warrant it, Tangi's paintings speaks directly to us. The trappings of retro chic that dilute the message of his gifted contemporaries are simply absent. There is no residue of either craft or literary content. His work is surrealism in its purest visual form and therefore ranks with the most powerful artifacts our century has produced. Okay, there you have it. Um, and so now I'm going to read a short playlist from 1989 and I'll be leaving off um, the performers and label information for time. So we have 1989, John Adams, Fearful Symmetries, The Wound Dresser, Ferruccio Busoni, Dr. Faust, uh, Francois Couperin, the Second Livre de Clave Clavecin, um, Sophia Gubadulina, Ofertorium, Witold Ludoslavsky, Volume 5, Symphony No. 3, Chain 1 for Chamber Orchestra, Chain 2 for Violin and Orchestra, Ad Libitum Abatuta. And then um, Bruno Moderna, Concerto per Violino, and Concerto Number no. 2, uh, per, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the proliferation of European languages is, uh, it's a lot, um, and uh, quadri, quadrivium. Okay, and then so lastly, I'm going to just read um, a short poem called Light Turnouts, that some people may be familiar with. Dear ghost, what shelter in the noonday crowd? I'm going to write an hour, then read what someone else has written. You've no mansion for this to happen in, but your adventures are like safe houses. You're knowing where to stop an adventure of another order, like seizing the weather. We are too embroiled in this scene of happening. And when we speak the same phrase together, we used to have one of those. It matters like a shot in the dark. One of us stays behind. One of us advances on the bridge as on a carpet. Life, it's marvelous, follows and falls behind. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, I am going to read uh, a poem and then a piece of writing, a piece of criticism by Ashbury. Um, the poem is called Flow, it's from the book Flowchart, um, which came out in 1991. And this is an excerpt of an excerpt from part two. 
no one has to reinvent himself at each new encounter with something different or slightly new. Nowhere does it say that the results will issue from a recent overhauling. We don't know what hamlets lie in our path or how much grumbling will occur. When we knock over something metallic and it makes a loud clang audible on the stairs below, or whether there will be a comic ending to this. We can see into the future as into a dimple and nothing says not to proceed, to go on planning. Though we know this cannot be taken as an authorization, even less as approval of the morass of projects like half-assembled half watches that surround us. No, but there is a logic to be used in such situations and only then. A curl of smoke or fuzziness in distant trees that tempts one down the slope. And sure enough, there is a village festive preparations, a votive smile on the face of each inhabitant that lets you pass through unquestioned. And we thought we were lucky back there in the silence. Here, civilization takes over. At its highest, a new trope that dazzles without intimidating like a scroll is ready for us. And however many more of us it takes to change moods, build the palace of reason, our inconsequence has promised for so long now out of shrewd granite blocks fired with chips of mica. And so get over feeling oppressed so as to be able to construct the small song, our prayer at the center of whatever void we may be living in, a romantic nocturnal place that must sooner or later go away. At that point we'll have lived and the having done so would be a passport to a permanent adjacent future the adult equivalent of innocence in a child or lost sweetness in a remembered fruit, something to tell time by. Um, and I'm going to read uh, a short piece on Frank Faulkner from uh, 1990. I first saw Frank Faulkner's paintings in about 1975 when a friend visiting from California took me to his host studio. What struck me immediately was how remote from current art world fashions his work was. Those obsessions, those obsessively patterned maze-like diagrams studded with knobs of glistening plastic were more like African ceremonial masks or shields than say pattern painting, a short-lived flirtation with decorative flourishes that was in any event still several seasons away. When it did finally emerge as the movement, some might have been tempted to situate Faulkner's work on its multicolored fringes. Yet pattern painting, like so many American art movements, came with the barely hidden moral agenda attached. Low equals high. Rauschenberg erases the crooning, wallpaper is as good as Matisse. In other words, you're not allowed to enjoy the gilding unless you swallow the didactic pill as well. Faulkner's work, which has evolved slowly and steadily from its beginnings, has no pills and no gilding. If it resembles any contemporary school, it might be minimalism in music, which appears to have undergone a similar evolution. First conceived by Philip Plass and Steve Reich as perhaps an antidote to both too strict and too free forms of musical expression, Babbitt and Cage, for instance, not that there was anything wrong with them, but art has to progress somehow, and this usually involves stepping on toes and having one's toes stepped on later, one's own stepped on later on. This reaction was, of course, not without a didactic purpose of its own, but something funny happened on the way to post-minimalism. The music began to complicate itself, contradict itself, so that today it has come full circle back to the randomness and the sometimes resulting richness of all music. John Adams' singular and singularly unlike recent compositions, The Wound Dresser and Fearful Cemeteries are but two examples among many, but in order for these outbursts of fresh invention to come about, the composer had to approach them through the back door of a self-imposed discipline, in this case, minimalism. Each succeeding generation of artists is obliged to reinvent the wheel, to discover the art that always that is always there with its own newly crafted tools. Frank Faulkner, it seems, has imposed similarly similar disciplines on his own work with similar results. The hieratic patterning, the horror vacuity, the compulsion to cover every inch of canvas with a predetermined pattern are still there, 
as is the idea of the artist as shaman-like image maker chained to the canons of his craft. Over the years, however, the art has changed as gradually and as subtly as the linear decoration of primitive pottery slowly congeals and recasts itself into blocks of pattern over a period of thousands of years. The schematic underpinning is still there, but in these late works, and it can explode into something almost but not quite like brilliant chaos, as in miasma. Here, the complexity of the given task wanders off into unexpectedness in the very act of fulfilling itself. And with this comes a new, almost offhand, barbarous richness of color and metier. The patient craftsmanship of the equatorial ex photo maker has metamorphosed into the ferocious splendor of a Scythian goldsmith's or armorer's work. Artifacts meant to allude to the cruelty of the hunt, to passionate and savage conquests, even as they are being ritually used. Just as his titles now suggest vast geographical reaches, continent, Sargasso, the paintings themselves now evoke huge maps with minds of their own, or labyrinths with directional indications too infrequent to help one find one way out of the maze, but sufficient to make one want to plunge into it. Continent, for instance, thrusts its checkered lozenge shapes at us insistently, as insistently as a continent would press itself on an explorer. The outlines are clear in general, but there are stray paths and counter proposals that throw us off balance, even though on closer inspection, they too seem to be traces of a schema so large that we see only fragments of it. But for the enchanter in whose mind they exist complete, this is a matter of indifference. He knows what he knows. Meanwhile, what counts for us is the gorgeous and seemingly arbitrary fluctuations of a visible dream whose roots are nonetheless deeply anchored in reason. They are like a visual demonstration of Blake's proverb, eternity is in love with the productions of time. Happy birthday, John. Um, I, um, I think John would be really tickled um, that we're all here celebrating his birthday and this book. I just want to say congratulations to Jeffrey and to Monica um, for this uh, kind of amazing book. And I've never seen a book like this before. So um, I think it's a really interesting model for putting a lot of different work in context. I wanted to tell just a quick, quick story before I read a poem and then a little, um, one of the pieces, um, I saw that Brian Eno's music for airports was on um, one of the playlists and John um, told me a story about the first time he encountered that piece of music. Um, he was actually in an airport. Um, he was on his way to, to do a reading and he had actually forgotten to bring a copy of his most recent book. So he went to the bookstore to see if they had it. And I think they did, which is just a testament to, to John that they would have one of his books in an airport bookstore. Um, and Brian Eno's music for airports was playing in this bookstore. I think maybe because they thought it was actually airport music for airports. Um, and as he brought up the book to, to kind of check out, uh, he said, he said to the um, to the person behind the counter, what is this music? It's so incredible. Um, and they said, I don't know, mister, but could you tell them to stop playing it? It's driving us nuts. <laughs> so um, I just love that story. And I think that's where he um, the first um, encountered that, that piece. Um, I'm going to read a poem, um, Wakefulness, from the 1998 collection of the same title. Um, and um, I'm going to take a sip of my modest little white wine and, and cheers to John. Wakefulness, an immodest little white wine, some scattered seraphs, recollections of the fall. Tell me, has anyone made a spongier representation, chased fewer demons out of the parking lot where we all held hands? Little by little, the idea of the true way returned to me. I was touched by your care, 
reduced to fawning excuses. Everything was spotless in the little house of our desire. The clock ticked on and on, happy about being apprenticed to eternity. A gavotte of dust motes came to replace my seeing. Everything was as though it had happened long ago in ancient peach colored funny papers wherein the law of true opposites was ordained casually. Then the book opened by itself and read to us. You pack of liars, of course tempted by the crossroads, but I like each and every one of you with a peculiar sapphire intensity. Look, here is where I failed at first. The client leaves. History goes on and on, rolling distractedly on these shores. Each day dawn condenses like a very large star, bakes no bread, shoes the faithless. How convenient if it's a dream. And the next sleeping car was madness. An urgent languor installed itself as far as the cabbage hemmed horizons. And if I put a little bit of myself in this time, stoppered the liquor that is ourselves, truant exchanges, brandished my intentions for once. But only I get something out of this memory, a kindly gnome of fear perched on my dashboard once but we had all been instructed to ignore the conditions of the chase. Here, it seems to grow lighter with each passing century. No matter how you twist it, life stays frozen in the headlights. Funny, funny, none of us heard the roar. Um, and I'm just also gonna read this little piece on, on, called On Joe Brainerd, On Joe Brainerd. Um, and uh, Brainerd would often uh, send John pieces, I think, for John's own collages. And so I love that not only were they friends and not only does this piece talk about, you know, Brainerd's personality, which, you know, is a really interesting thing to talk about in, in you know, ostensibly art criticism, but I love that there is a like a material connection inside that, you know, in that, in Brainerd's kindness that he was sending um, Ashbery actual collage pieces for clippings. On Joe Brainerd. Joe Brainerd was one of the nicest artists I've ever known. Nice as a person and nice as an artist. This could be a problem. Think of all the writers, especially those whose work you admire, who weren't all that nice. Caravaggio, Degas, Gauguin, De Chirico, Picasso, Pollock. Their art isn't exactly nice either, but the issue seldom arises. In Joe's case, it does. He began around the time that pop art did. With Lichtenstein or Warhol, there is a subtext of provocation, though the pop artists generally were too cool, too down, as we used to say, to let this possibility become anything more than unspoken. In Joe's work, one of his pictures of pansies, for instance, there is confrontation without provocation. A pansy is a loaded subject. So is the effortless, seed packet look of the painting. But there's no apparent of effort on the artist's part to cause stress or wonderment in the viewer. With Joe, a relief and gratitude mingle in the pleasure he offers us. One can sincerely admire the chic and the implicit nastiness of a Warhol soup can without ever wanting to cozy up to it. And perhaps that is as it should be, art being art, a rather distant thing. In the case of Joe, one wants to embrace the pansy, so to speak, make it feel better about being itself all alone, a silly kind of expression on its face, forced to bear the brunt of its name eternally. Then we suddenly realize that it's doing for us, that everything will be okay if we just look at it, accept it, and let it be itself. And something deeper and more serious than the result of provocation emerges, joy sobriety, nutty poetry. There are, however, no histoires à l'eau de rose here, nor is Joe's book of I Remembers for family viewing. Some indeed seem to require a new rating for humane smut, though they are so cleverly interleaved among others, like, quote, I remember wondering if I looked queer, and, quote, I remember the rather severe angles of oriental lampshades, end quote that one can't say for sure. One is, quote, 
taken aback. The writing and the art are relaxed, not raging in their newness, careful of our feelings, careful not to hurt them by so much as taking them into account. They go about their business of being, which in the end makes us better for having seen and lived with them and better for not feeling indebted to them, thanks to the artists having gone to such lengths for us not to feel that. Joe was a creature of incredible tact and generosity. He often gave his work to his friends, but before you could even feel obliged to him, he was already there, having anticipated the problem several moments or paragraphs earlier and remedying it while somehow managing to deflect your attention from it. Into something else, a compassionate atmosphere, where looking at his pictures and recognizing their references and modest autobiographical aspirations would somehow make you a nicer person without your realizing it and having to be grateful. It's for this, I think, that his work is so radical, that we keep returning to it again and again, finding something that is new, bathing in its curative newness. Joe seems to have taken extraordinary pains for us not to know about his art. Either he would create 3,000 tiny works for a show, far too many to take in, or be intentionally less prolific as he was in the last decade of his life, indulging in his two favorite hobbies, smoking and reading novels, mostly Victorian or Barbara Pym's. It's as though in an ultimate gesture of niceness, he didn't want us to have, to have the bother of bothering with him. Maybe that's why the work today hits us so hard, sweeping all before it, our hesitations and his, putting us back in the place where we always wanted to be the delicious chromatic center of the Parcheesi board. Okay, uh, that was great. I forgot that about what he wrote about Joe. Uh, so I don't read about uh, on Trevor Wingfield, another favorite artist of uh, John's. Uh, written in 1997. Let me see if I can. Okay. If all art aspires toward the condition of music, as Pater wrote, Trevor Wingfield must be counted among the most successful artists of all time. A picture such as his great recent voyage, 11, totally fulfills that condition. The accuracy and surprises of great music even its linear unscrolling or what confronts us. In fact, its effect is the same one a musical score offers a person with some ability for reading music, sight reading. Each element in the painting has its precise pitch, its duration. It's as though seeing and hearing merged in a single act and the meaning of the picture were lodged at the intersection of the two of the senses where one is pleasurably enmeshed, deliciously hindered, the strange erection on the left, a toy windmill with dysfunctional looking paddles. Isn't it from the coat of arms of some ancient and distinguished purveyor or something or other to the royal family? Firmly placed on a pedestal fashioned of bricks, tomatoes, and other less nameable objects, is there to cast the authority of its key signature over the frieze on the right, whose elements include a harp, a seagull, some nautical looking pennants, three table utensils tied together with a red bow, and at the far right, some wave-like scallops and stylized drops of water that suggest the musical symbol for de capo al thinking. Go back and start all over, you idiot. One of the heroes in Winkfield's pantheon, the Sati, author of strut, author of a strut piano piece called Vexations, and it's meant to be repeated 840 times. There are also three identical hands, each one a different hue, and each holding what may be an empty ice cream cone. But the third cone has something attached to it that looks like a drooping slice of flan. There are two sculptural heads, one Greek, the other that of a medieval big league, Charlemagne perhaps, 
Both are gazing to the left, westward, where the music is coming from. And each is bathed in a different light for which no source is apparent. These are the describable things, but there are less identifiable ones in which the same amount of objective care has been lavished. Three-dimensional grids, strips and colored lines, some stylized leaves at the top, and the Greek figure's curious torso, like a child's top. The colors are those of brand new but antique toys that have been randomly stacked together. Intense pastel greens, banana yellow, vermilion, chartreuse, Tabasco red, Kool-Aid grape, an assembly whose components ought to scream at each other, but which are instead intoning something ineffable, some music of the spheres, though the spheres appear to be rolling around on the floor of a nursery rather than in the heavens. One could go on listening and describing to small purpose and with less effect than the words of Wingfield's friend, the late James Schuyler. What's clear is that there is no verbal equivalent for taking in the picture, just as there's none for assimilating a piece of music, which is as it should be. The experience in both cases amounts to what? Perhaps the very what in Jasper Johns's title, according to what? Something is regulating everything and placing its parts in the proper relation to each other, but that thing is unknown, a blank, though a fundamental one. One reflects on how so much modern art is concerned with dropping things out, the momentous vacancies in Cezanne, in Cubist still eyes, in Henry Morris Holes, and Giacometti's erasures, and how an equally important activity has been filling things up again, how the ashen empty glasses in Picasso's 1910 still eyes are brimming with violent colored lemonade, Suze and Cassis after 1914. Wingfield has somehow managed to combine both of these natural impulses to drain and to replenish to build and to destroy. And he locates the core of creation precisely there at the plume saw line with the glass is both empty and half full where ec ecstasy means having exactly enough. That's a great piece, yikes. I'm gonna read a playlist from 1997 and 98. Uh, Paul Bowles, the music of Paul Bowles, Francois Couperin, Le Conte de Tenebre, Robin Holloway, Third Concerto for Orchestra, 1998, John Cage, Music of Changes, Brian Eno, Music for Airports, and Jean Francais, L'Apocalypse, Salon Saint Jean. And then I read a section from Girls on the Run based on his uh, encounter with Mr. Darger at the Phyllis Kine Gallery. He did once say about the artist Jim Nutt, do you think he lives up to his name? That was how he described Jim Nutt to me. Hope Jim's not listening. All right, from Girls on the Run. The thread ended up on the floor where threads go. It became a permanent thing like silver. Every time you polish it, a little goes away. Then the ducks arrived. It was raining, such a lot of going around and doing. Sometimes they were in sordid sexual situations and others, a smidgen of fun would intrude on our day, which exists to be intruded on anyway. Its value to us is incommensurate with, let's say, the concept of duration, which kills surely as a serpent hiding behind a stump. Our phrase books begin, began to feel useless. For once you have learned a language, what is there to do but forget it? An illustration changes us. Thanks. Thank you, John, and thank you, everybody for your readings.
<laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, we just have a little bit of time, so we're gonna try to have a little bit of a chat as best we can. Um, actually, John, I'm gonna start with you um, because I think you probably had the experience of, of going to look at art with, with John Ashbery. I did. Yeah, maybe you could just talk about that and um, what that meant and whether poetry came into the viewing or, or how you feel that those two practices may have related to one another. Well, I remember we, we went to uh, the Jasper John show at Leo Castelli when Johns had changed his work radically and people were all flustered by it. And John wasn't flustered by it at all. He's like, oh, when we just walked around looking at it. So there was that side of John where he didn't, you know, think someone changed their work radically and he wouldn't get, he wouldn't think that was weird. Uh, and then I think he, I remember he said once about a Bryce Martin, I think it was a black painting. He said, it looks as good. You could want to lick it like ice cream. So he'd just make these oddball remarks, which I thought was fabulous because in a way it's like he was completely serious, but he's also humorous. And then That's I'll- like a perfect description of Ashbury's poetry. <laughs> and I'll just, there's one anecdote. So John and I were going somewhere and he said, oh, I have to stop at New York Magazine because they want me to edit one of my pieces. And he says, it's 200 words too long. Goes in, comes out 15 minutes later and says, let's go. And it was clear he was not a prima donna. Like he was just adapt to the situation. And that just meant a lot to me to see this amazing person deal with this, you know, working situation and still turn out pieces like the ones we've read, right? So. Oh, thank you, John. And I have to say, you know, we I, I picked a few pieces for us to read, mainly because they're short and they're great pieces, but there, there are several rather extensive pieces that are really, really, really fabulous. Oh, he's a wonderful writer. Yeah. Okay. Um, Emily, because you, you worked as John's assistant for some time, and um, we know that he listened to music while writing. Could you just talk about that? I'm curious, did he buy an album and then play it over and over again? Did he jump around to old things and go to new ones? How did that actually happen while he was working on something? So I know I said I would answer this question, but I was, he would never write poetry while I was there. Uh. But, <laughs> um, but uh, um, uh, David Kermani often, you know, kind of wrote down the piece of music that he was listening to, like on the, the drafts of the poem, which is a really amazing kind of archival um, practice. Um, and I know that he did listen to music. And one of my favorite things to do um, as his assistant is he would get these um, music catalogs like Fanfare or American Record Guide. Um, and he would kind of circle things that looked interesting and then he loved reading them. He read everything. I mean, he, <laughs> he would read anything you put in front of him, but um, he subscribed to these. And so then he would kind of, I would go through and find the ones he circled and order them for him. And it was, um, a lot of classical music. I remember once when he was really into um, the, the, I think it's called microtonal, I know nothing about music. <laughs> um, microtonal composer, Ben Johnston. Um, he was really into that and he, would, he was listening to that over and over for a while. Um, but music was like really, it seemed really a part of his, um, kind of process um, uh, of writing. And it's it's so great to have these kind of little collections of playlists. I have to um, say even, and, and the, the, the uh, pieces I picked out for the playlist are the composers that show up over and over again that he seemed to be buying a lot of in a certain year. So they're really representative, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to just tell you quickly, well, one, uh, two things. Uh, and I want to hear from everybody. Um, we have in our uh, Ashbury Resource Center special collection library, a, a file card box of file cards he made when I think he was 14. He made his own library cards for every LP he bought. Wow. 
even back then, and they tend to be rather obscure classical pieces, um, along with the, the much more contemporary thorny stuff that he came to love much more later. And I have to tell you quickly, the first time I ever met him, um, it was at an award ceremony for the Poetry Society of America, the Frost Medal. And I happened to have under my arm a copy of Proust, and it was going to, I think, that I was reading at the time. And he, as I walked up, and I was very, you know, bashful to, to meet the great poet, and he noticed I was reading Proust, and he's immediately just a very open and friendly person and said, oh, you're reading Proust, where are you in the book? And I said, oh, M has just met Rachel. And he said, ah, Rachel from, um, went from the Lord, which is the nickname that M has for Rachel in the book, which if you know your Proust, you know is a fairly obscure reference to an aria from the opera La Juive by Elavi. John then launched into singing that aria in French. Well, that was my first experience of him, kind of remarkable. Yeah, wow. So I wanna ask um, others here um, who engage in both art writing and poetry, if you just have any thoughts in your own practice of how one does or does not inform the other, or do you keep them absolutely compartmentalized? I'm just curious to hear. Can I say something about Ashbery Please. instead? Yeah, I have nothing to say about myself, but I I wanted to say in in reading that that Yves Tanguy piece, it's amazing because he he basically says that there's there's no surrealism in either painting or literature, or rather in either literature or painting. He starts out there, and then he's like, oh yeah, in these late Tanguy paintings, there's some there's this substance that we can call surrealist. But it's like after everything has has happened, and in it's such a like as a critical gesture. It's a very strange gesture to make, and I, I think it's something to just like think about for a little while, like what that what that means, and in terms of style, like a kind of thinking about how one hunts for a style or how one determines that one has you know, arrived at a very specific kind of aesthetic substance and how he's like kind of trying to take things away um, to see what he can get and like how he can find it. I find it very strange. I just want to say like a little thing, like it's weird that there's no Roussel in that essay and, and that's all I'll say about that, but it's like quite an interesting critical technique and very apropos of what you were saying, Jeffrey, about the idea of developing one's own poetics while doing criticism about other things. Yeah, thanks for that. That was a great, great answer. Um, Monica, I see you about to speak. Yeah, I also maybe um, I'm not that interested in, in talking about the way I handle this or not, because I, I don't I, I actually first don't really consider myself an art writer occasionally I write, but it's kind of like very much like Ashbury. I came up with a bunch of artists who were my friends and they needed catalog essays. And then, you know, oh, you're a writer and you're a poet. Why don't you do something and let's have fun together. And then it ends up, you know, amounting to something that I could look back on and go like, oh, actually, yeah, I did a lot. But so the question is, because I know we're gonna run it out of time. So um, especially, yeah, in the Tangi piece, I see it and I also see it in, um, in the piece that you read, Schiff, um, this notion of like him talking about things that definitely would apply to him. So like pattern decoration, high and low. And here he is like dismantling that notion that you have to do that, that it has to be didactic, that that is the program of his poetry, right? So he, he kind of like engages the subject, but, but, but um, contests the programmatic nature of the movement once it's constituted as such. And it's the same thing with surrealism. Some people might say, oh, his writing is surrealism. I don't get it. You know, it's like free association. So he's like, no, 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 no. It's actually quite rational. And there's all this stuff um, that, that, that you need both sides of the brain, in other words, to actually compose. Uh, so my question is, for those of you who write, like wh what art movements or what is the art that determined your or that that marked your approach to writing perhaps or what art are you in conversation with in your own writing and what's the stance is there critical distance are you debating some of the notions that might be associated with that art i just i just think that in my case i i, I could potentially maybe answer the question but i'm much more interested in how you would tackle that and you know what, I'm going to I'm going to throw this to Shiv and I want to add a little question to that you can answer either or neither. 
as you like, because you also work at the Warhol Foundation um, in where they fund art writing. And uh, I notice every year when there's the new grantees listed, so many of the grantees are also poets. So is that a thing? <laughs> Um, I think poets have a lot of artist friends um, who need catalog essays. <laughs> and uh, I think our, I think it's actually really important in a certain way to, no, maybe not important. Uh, I think it's really fun and also kind of a good way to commune with artists to like actually take their work seriously when it's emerging um, and to like figure out how to describe it and um, I think that there's, I think description can be poetic and analytical at the same time. Um, and learning how to do that, I think is like a poetic exercise for this one. Um, I want to just like backpack on Lucy and Monica, your um, observations and just say like another kind of like critical kind of like uh, device or kind of um, movement that happens in Ashbury's work. I was noticing John while you were reading which is to say that uh, basically uh, there, in that essay, there's nothing that's ineffable. Music is said to be something that there's not, like nothing can account for it, nothing can describe it, but yet it's effable. It's actually like speakable. And there's like this kind of like overturning the thing that is like too much by showing the thing and like it's beyond at the same time. And it's just like, here it is. Um, and, like here's, you know, civilization. Uh, it, 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 it's a really wonderful um, way of uh, doing, just actually saying what he's looking at. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest things to do. Um, um, th thank you for that. I have to say, I feel like we're just starting a, a discussion, but I think it's great to end with questions. That's the best way to end. Life is not about answers. Life is about questions if you wanna have a good life. And I think I'm gonna ask Monica to uh, conclude the hour with one final poem. Excellent. The poem is Uptick. We were sitting there and I made a joke about how it doesn't dovetail. Time, one minute running out faster than the one in front it catches up to. That way, I said, there can be no waste. Waste is virtually eliminated. To come back for a few hours to the present subject, a painting, looking like it was seen, half turning around, slightly apprehensive, but it has to pay attention to what's up ahead, a vision. Therefore, poetry dissolves in brilliant moisture and reads us to us, a faint notion, too many words, but precious. Thank you so much, Monica, for that wonderful reading. Um, and thank you so much to Jeffrey Leppendorf, John Yell, Lucy Ives, Monica, uh, Monica De La Torre, Shiv Kodika, uh, and Emily Skillings for joining us tonight. Um, it's been really wonderful uh, to hear all these pieces and sort of have this way to celebrate John's 95th birthday. Um, if you missed the beginning of the event or you'd like to share it with a friend, there's gonna be a recording posted immediately after um, on this page. And if you'd like to find out more about our panelists, there is biographical information on all of them right below us. Um, and actually each of them has been on a 192 Books event before. So if you wanna spend some more time with them, <laughs> just check out the archives. We've got Jeffrey talking to Rachel Corot about Colette, um, Shiv and Lucy reading with Robert Glick, uh, Monica reading and talking to uh, Wayne Kostenbaum and Emily and John from the Parallel Movements of the Hands Ashbury panel that we had uh, last year. If you wanna get a copy of Something Close to Music, you can come by 192 Books. Uh, we're open every day for browsing from 11 to seven. If you can't make it down to Chelsea or you don't live in the city, we also have a link to our bookshop.org page where you can order the book. Um, and yeah, our next event is Tuesday, August 2nd. We're gonna be talking to Lynn Tillman about her new book, Mother Care, alongside Christine Smallwood. So I hope that uh, we'll see you there. Thanks everyone for a great night.